Good evening. Thanks for being here. We are going to call to order the <coughs> Thursday, October 11th, 2018. Um, meeting of the Northampton Planning Board. We always start our meetings uh, opening up public comment for any item that is not on our agenda. So if there is public comment, please come up to the podium, state your name and address. Uh, I'm Carson Poe at, from 32 Masonic Street here in Northampton. And I'd just like to wish our acting planning board chair, uh, Teresa Peron Poe, happy birthday tomorrow. Oh, very much. <laughs> You? Uh, who's seeing her uh, I know, right? Oh, and now he leaves. And now he leaves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and That's the best public comment. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is part of my 12 day celebration. Um, so we have two hearings on the agenda for 7 p.m. The first is a site plan for Verizon Wireless to add panels to the existing pole at 190 <coughs> Spring Grove Avenue, Florence, map ID 17A 17. Is there a presentation from the applicant? Hi, good evening. My name is Eric Campbell. I'm here on behalf of Verizon Wireless, and we're seeking uh, approval for an installation of equipment on the pole that you suggested. Um, it's in front of 395 Elm Street. Uh, the panel antenna is going to be located on the top of a proposed 40-foot Class II pole with associated equipment on the pole. No ground equipment will be required. And um, can I pause you for just a moment? Sure. He's talking about the wrong one. So, oh, uh, we have, so we do have both hearings listed for 7 p.m. So, yes, I'm sorry. Um, so if you'd like, if you could start with the 190 Spring Grove Ave, yep. um, that would be I shall. in line with folks who are keeping track on our agenda here. There you go. Right, so um, we are proposing to put equipment uh, on 190 Spring Grove Ave in front of that address. Um, the antenna is going to be at the top of the existing 45 class guide pole. Uh, with associated equipment on the pole, no ground equipment will be required. Pole is screened from uh, the front of the house. Um, that's in front of, it's a guide pole. Uh, the regular line is on the other side. And so we're looking to uh, install the equipment on that. I do have some plans here. I'm gonna ask that A and E come up and go briefly over the installation. I have someone here from Hotel. Sure. As Eric said here, uh, this is a uh, small cell site at uh, the Spring Grove Avenue location. Um, what this is here. Point of order. Yeah, I think he's on. He is on camera. Can you see it? Maybe on the live stream? Yeah. And these plans are also included in the application, correct? Yeah. That is available yeah. online and in the planning office as well. Yeah. You might want to orient it a little bit that way so the public can see the... You guys have plans in front of you, right? Yes, so we do. We have hard copies. Um, anyway, um, the existing pole here is a 35-foot, uh, what they call a class uh, three pole, 45-foot uh, rather, um, about six or seven feet buried in the ground. Uh, so you end up with a, a top of pole height around 38, 39 feet. Um, it's what's called a guide pole. So it's a pole sort of on the opposite side of a street of a... Uh, of the normal utility run. Verizon's proposing to locate uh, small cell equipment, which consists of uh, basically uh, four items. Uh, the first is an antenna, which is a kind of a cylindrical antenna. Um, it's about uh, 14, uh, 15 inches in diameter, about uh, two feet tall. That's located at the top of the pole. Um, at the bottom, there's a meter and disconnect that provides the, the power the facility. Um, midway up the pole is um, <clears throat> equipment consisting of a, a, an RF radio, which uh, generates the signal that goes to the antenna. And of course, there's a, a telco requirement, a fiber backhaul that uh, allows the network to talk. So these, these items here are mounted on the existing pole. Um, the rest of the plan set here is basically just sort of some details on how those attachments occur. 
Um, again, we talked a little bit about the antenna um, and uh, how it's mounted to top the pole. Uh, really, here, <coughs> this equipment, the small cell equipment, is, is called small because the equipment's actually small and it covers a small area. Um, this type of equipment is no larger than typical pole mounted transformers that, we, that are ubiquitous that we see everywhere on these types of structures. I'm going to now ask that uh, Verizon's IRF engineer come up and just explain the need for it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Latori. I'm a radio frequency engineer with Verizon Wireless. My home address is 122 Forest Hills Road in Springfield. I'm here today to talk to you about the facility on the Spring Grove Avenue that Verizon calls Northampton Small Cell One. Um, my colleague is passing out a engineering necessity case document for you that I prepared and was also included as part of the application. Um, and in addition was amended um, following some comments that we got back um, uh, from the board. Um, there's a lot of um, Inform, uh, information in here um, and I can walk you through um, any of it that you'd like me to but I'm just going to touch on a couple of points um, um, as Eric mentioned um, Verizon uh, has deployed small cell technology uh, in any in many municipalities across western Massachusetts and across New England um, small cells are as they're mentioned small facilities uh, typically utilizing existing right-of-way infrastructure like this utility pole. They typically provide uh, Verizon Wireless's uh, wireless service in a range of anywhere between 500 to 1,000 feet, uh, typically in a, a radius and a 360-degree pattern. Um, the facilities are designed to uh, enhance wireless service and augment capacity in areas where uh, service may be less than robust or where um, there is a noticeable um, demand for capacity. Um, in this particular circumstance, there are uh, two driving forces here. Um, I'm going to ask that if everyone could please go to the slide. Um, I apologize, this uh, document doesn't have page numbers on it, but if you go towards the back, you'll see a page that looks like this. It says coverage at 2100 megahertz, and it has two maps on it. Everyone find that okay? Yep. Okay, great. So the map on the left-hand side shows Verizon's 2100 megahertz coverage. That's the frequency that Verizon broadcasts uh, what it calls its XLTE service. Uh, this is Verizon's uh, high-speed 4G LTE service that it provides to its customers. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, kind of a larger zoomed-out view of this service in the area. We have two facilities. Um, in this uh, particular area of the city, one of which is um, a large tower, tower um, to the north. Um, and then there is another facility down in Florence on a smokestack. And then you'll see towards the middle, you'll see a, a circle that's not colored in. And that represents the proposed facility. Um, there's different coverage uh, levels that are shown here, the, the green uh, signal strength represents uh, reliable <coughs> indoor coverage. Uh, the yellow is uh, meant to represent reliable uh, in-car coverage. And the gray, which is a little bit fader, um, faded, is meant to show um, reliable in, uh, outdoor coverage. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if one of these three um, areas is not covered <coughs> that there's no coverage. Verizon does have different frequencies that provide um, different levels of service. However, this facility is designed to show this one frequency. So I just wanted to highlight uh, this to you. And you'll see on the right-hand side, the proposed 2100 megahertz coverage map, you'll see with the proposed facility modeled and activated, you'll see a large area of green, yellow, and some gray that fills in um, that small area. And if you um, turn that page, you'll see a third coverage map that is zoomed in. Um, this is some feedback that we got from the board requesting that we get a better view of what this facility is designed to cover. So you'll see um, it's, a, it's a fairly small area. It can cover, um, you know, uh, there's roughly about 
eight to 10 streets that will benefit from it. Uh, in particular, the, um, my decision to locate a facility here was, was based on a desire to enhance service at uh, JFK Middle School and in and around it. Um, in particular, um, earlier this year, I had, after I had already designed these sites, uh, met with Mr. Pagan from the IT uh, department and the school department um, to walk some of these buildings, including the other um, facility that we'll talk about tonight, um, to kind of gauge what service was like inside. And, um, you know, we feel very confident that the proposed facility will augment service and that does a lot of great things, in particular, <coughs> in, uh, you know, um, helps with public safety, but also can help with uh, innovation and education as more schools embrace uh, technology and their education platform. Um, that's basically uh, the highlights of the, the RF justification, and I'll be available to answer any questions you may have. I, I have one quick question just for folks who are listening who may have looked at your application before coming tonight. Are these two maps the, the main um, thing that's different about what was previously submitted? Or are, is there anything else in here that's different from what folks would have seen in the existing application? So, so this map right here, the zoomed in map, uh -huh. is really um, the only thing that's different Still. about this particular application. Yeah. On the second application, which I can, I can call out as well for you, um, either now or later, there's two differences that I'll mention. Okay. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. I, I have a question, actually. Oh, on yes. on the, this page, the one that has the double maps, you said there's a... a a tower or a facility to the north and one to the south. Is the one to the north on the map? You know what, I, I do apologize for that, Miss. I, I noticed that uh, it is it is on the map and it's covered by my... Um, by the legend. By the legend. I'm very okay. sorry for that. That's okay, yeah. I just wanted to... Forgive me for the, the lack of um, total knowledge, but I, I think it's, is it called Horse Mountain? Am I, am I getting that right? Further, I'm not further sure. North, where the, the elevation oh, really rises towards Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. There's, I believe there's at least two towers up there and that's where that facility is. Okay, so it's oh, covered it's somewhere underneath that legend approximately. Correct. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, I'm sorry for okay. that omission. That's, that's fine. Good. Anything else I can answer right now? Just to add to uh, Jay's point, I know that uh, when I have young kids and I go to the school, there's usually a drop off, there's people waiting, there are people um, uh, at events or uh, sport events and there's a lot of data being used. So I know that um, you know there is a need uh, for areas where there's a lot of populated, a lot of people and a lot of uh, functions going on. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other benefits that this provides is that when you have a site that's targeting certain areas, it allows the other sites to work better and therefore makes the network uh, more efficient. Um, I know that uh, you probably heard uh, there's a lot of um, 911 calls that come from mobile phones. That's uh, a drastic increase from uh, previous years. Mm -hmm. Data use has gone up quite a bit as well. Um, just over half, 50% of <coughs> households uh, only have a mobile device connection, uh, but for millennials, uh, that number increases to over two thirds who live in a mobile household only. So a lot of people are cutting their landlines and using mobile only. Um, video uh, has gone up to uh, around 70% uh, for traffic data. Teen usage for cellular data for smartphones, videos has grown 127% in 15 months. Uh, teens have increased smartphone TV video viewing by 85% in the last four years, and 76% was the uh, percentage of 911 calls that originate from a cell phone. So there's a lot of benefits that uh, this cell site provides. I know that some people will say, well, I don't have Verizon, so how does this benefit me? But I think everyone benefits from people having service. Uh, people contact you, other people contact you, other people can call 911 for you, other people can uh, report uh, break-ins or accidents or other things. I know uh, public safety uses it quite a bit as a secondary means of communication. I know that uh, a lot of um, cities are looking to become more smart, so they're looking for autonomous cars, they're looking for uh, wireless metering and things like that. So I think the um, increase in data and increase in these services are only gonna grow and what Verizon is trying to do is target areas where there's going to be 
a lot of use and therefore allow the other uh, sites around to work better. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Any questions? So we'll open it up to public comment now. So our public hearing is open. So if you do have public comment, you can have a seat and then we'll have folks um, who wish to make a comment, please come to the podium. And again, please state your name uh, and your address um, and don't be shy. So I see someone in the back, come on up. Good evening. Yeah. Hi. Sue Timberlake. And that tower is gonna be about 25 feet from my house, my roof line. And it's actually inside my fence. And when they've changed the pole out this past year, I want to put a driveway on that side of my house. And the guys were very nice. They moved it another three feet to the side so that I have a shot at doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against um, cell towers. I actually put a micro cell in my house mm -hmm. in Cummington because I had no cell service. So I had a repeater that I put in, which is a micro cell. I don't understand exactly, <coughs> excuse me, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. Um, I don't understand exactly what the watts are and which particular frequencies. You said 4G, but 4G is 700 megahertz. Um, I believe uh, that you mean 5G and 6G. So I want you to specifically say which frequencies. Jim, I'm just, yeah, just going to ask you to keep kind of talking. Sorry. About and how much the we'll make sure that we get all that information. Yeah, my, my <laughs> voice is I'm losing my voice today. I think I'm sick. Anyway, um, what the voltages are, you know, the wattage, the power and what the actual frequencies are so that you can see them. I read your documents very carefully. And like I said, I don't, I don't understand given what you just said. Um, where frequency? Sorry, I just made a few notes to make yeah. sure I got them all. Um, <coughs> I heard you say that there's a backhaul fiber optic cable. And uh, I hate Comcast. I would love to have Fios. And so I will not give you any trouble if you gave me an optical fiber line to my house <laughs> and took it five. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's on your network. You're the right company. And I know Northampton has a non-exclusive license for optical fiber connections. So, And the third thing is that I have a bush that's right there. And when they put the pole in, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. When they put the pole in, I said, sure, just cut it. It's really brambly, but it is an ornamental bush. Now it's sort of dead center in the middle of it. And I assume you're going to ask me to just get rid of it. And so I want to make sure whether it's clear or not, whether that or my apple tree will be affected. And um, I, I want the um, power at the pole, <coughs> because if I remember physics correctly, it's equal to the inverse square of the distance. And so. I want to know what you're powering it with so that I can calculate the power at my roof line. And my upstairs, which is a little cape, it doesn't look like it's occupied, but there's actually an in-law apartment mm -hmm. not far from there. And the third thing is, and I think some of my other colleagues will say this, uh, why not the cemetery? If you're trying to cover the school, why not come in from that side or from the front of the school if you're trying to get all the people with cell phones. So, and unfortunately I have AT&T, so thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna keep taking comments from the public, then we'll ask you to come back and clarify some things and we'll kind of recap uh, issues. Come on up. Hi. Hello, my name is Karen Schiaffo and I, I live at uh, 211 Spring Grove Avenue, but I'm also the nurse at JFK. So I wanted to just uh, say a few things. Personally, I'm opposed to the tower in my neighborhood and near the school. Uh, according to the Environmental Tr uh, Health Trust, most government regulations on allowable public exposures are set too high to protect the public. Furthermore, federal guidelines are based on research that doesn't consider special vulnerable populations such as children. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics raised concerns about increased exposure um, to radio frequency electromagnetic radiation emitted from cell phones and phone station antennae. Um, the one question that I have is um, if this is being um, proposed for cell phone use, the mass the vast majority of the inhabitants of JFK don't use cell phones. The students cannot use their cell phones. So it would just be uh, faculty. Um, so if that's what this is going to improve, 
enhanced um, cell phone use, it doesn't really apply. The other thing is um, for calling 911 and all of that, we have, I'm the one that calls 911. I'm in the building for an emergency and we have landlines and we have walkie talkies that are connected to our emergency medical personnel. So I guess I need clarification on that. Um, I just, I just want to make it clear that cell phone use has increased and everybody wants it, but I, I really feel that it's important that we, we have information to study the effects on the human body and long-term risk to health regarding cell tower radiation. And I, I feel that um, I would like this tower, if it needs to happen at all, I would like this tower to be not near JFK. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Other comments from the public? So I think we will ask the applicant to clarify a couple of couple of things, if you would. Uh, I don't know if one of you is better positioned to answer some of these questions, but maybe we can start with the sure. specifics. Sure, I'll, I'll, I think I'll try to hit as everything as I can, and then I'll ask it if, um, to, to grab anything that I missed. And okay. in addition, if the board um, feels that we missed anything, just let us know, and we'll continue to um, uh, answer those questions. First of all, so, so I think the first question was, what is the frequency? Mm -hmm. So the frequency is uh, 2100 megahertz mm -hmm. or 2.1 gigahertz. Um, that's the output frequency. The, the next question, and if the board will allow, I won't get into a, a dissertation, but I'll just do a little explanation. There was a question about 4 versus 5 versus 6G. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is 4G uh, LTE technology. That's long-term evolution. Um, and um, if you'll allow me to <coughs> clarify, um, LTE is a standard. It's not necessarily tied to a particular frequency. So for example, in Western Massachusetts, Verizon Wireless uses 4G LTE technology at 700 megahertz, at 850 megahertz, at 1900 megahertz, and 2100 megahertz. So they, they all have the same radio access technology. They just have different frequencies, and among other things, that affects um, the wavelength of a signal, and that will in turn affect uh, how far a signal might travel and its ability to um, work into buildings, into basements, into older structures, things like that. Um, I'm going to defer to Eric and Jesse on the, on the bush and the uh, question of the apple tree. Um, I, I know there's some coordination that we're capable of doing, but I'm um, I'll defer to them on that. There was a question of the total power. Um, Jesse, I'll ask you to touch on that as well, but I'll just mention um, that the radio that Verizon will deploy is capable of 45 watts output, and I, I also know that the, the power itself will take a secondary power uh, off the utility pole line, and I'll ask Jesse to kind of talk about that. Um, I'm going to refer everyone to, there is a, um, a section in the uh, Verizon Wireless um, Engineering Necessity case that goes to uh, radio emission safety. And if, it, if I may, I'm just going to read it into the record. Sure. Um, a common question we hear on our wireless site projects is, are the radio emissions safe? We go to great effort to ensure that all our projects meet the regulations set by the FCC to ensure safety of the public and our employees. There are a number of questionable sources of information available on this subject that are not supported by science. Below are links to three organizations that have performed extensive reviews of the science available on this subject and have good educational articles on the results of the research. Now, I don't, I don't mean to read that in any way as to suggest that any research that was done was not done with research or isn't uh, reputable. That, that's just language in the documentation. Um, but I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, the FCC, uh, I feel, has um, stringent standards um, for RF safety. In particular, uh, the standards are five times, um, how should I say this? They require RF levels to be five times lower for the general public than for someone like me who is educated in RF emission safety. Um, so I feel very confident that this facility um, is going to meet all of those standards. I've already modeled it. 
uh, and confirmed it. Um, it's it's relatively low power. If you, you know if you were to compare it to a, you know a cable television station or satellite TV, um, and there's some additional information in here that can be looked at. And I'll just say in addition. Um, Although I haven't read every part of the 1996 um, SEC law verbatim, um, I've read quite a bit of it. And one thing that always strikes me is that um, if you look at the number of people that were involved um, in putting it together, I mean, there were government officials from multiple agencies, um, there were uh, RF emissions experts, there were professors from several different universities, there was uh, public safety experts. Now, I really looked at it. Um, and said, wow, there were a lot of people with maybe a lot of different viewpoints and different, um, you know, prerogatives that came together to come up with some uh, standards. So, um, you know, Verizon, again, its public statement is that this site will uh, comply with all SCC emissions. Um, and then just to, to mention uh, the E911 concerns, that, that's another really great one, and, and I agree. Um, and for a lot of different emergencies, the most likely person to make a call is going to be um, emergency professional staff. And it's also true in, uh, in a middle school um, that you know uh, some of the um, you know calls are going to generate from staff, adults. Um, but we we do see um, increased usage from middle schools. It really depends on the family whether they decide it's appropriate for their child to have a phone when they're 11 or 14. Those are all middle school ages. Um, you know, and, um, you know, we also see, uh, unfortunately, in cases of, um, you know, um, incidents in schools, the, the stories of students um, that talk about texting their friends, using Snapchat to let their friends know that they're safe and where they are and where to go, um, you know, um, and so we just want to, again, reemphasize, we're excited about the fact that having wireless service, we think, goes a long way to, uh, reducing the digital divide in communities and increases learning opportunities, especially in schools. But we're also proud of the fact that we think that robust wireless service goes a long way to ensuring um, public safety for everyone. And another thing I, I just want to clarify, I don't know if it was asked, but Eric mentioned it. Even if you're not a Verizon customer, and this is true for all the carriers in the United States, if you make a 911 call and the only carrier that you can get is not yours, that call goes through. That's something that's national. That's a national standard to make sure that everyone has access to emergency services. Um, Eric or Jesse, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I'd like to address the uh, first question with regards to the bushes and the uh, um, the concern that they had around that. I, I can show you that on the pole itself, they actually do install the equipment not in the back, but to the opposite side of traffic. And it hits the pole it's on the uh, the back side of it, so there won't there won't be uh, this equipment facing the opposite side on the uh, on the center of the pole. So uh, that will help. But I think the other thing that we might be able to do is I can talk to construction. We can either flag something around it, saying that we need to be careful and not uh, go deep into this the back portion of the pole where the uh, bushes are, and uh, maybe. Uh, coordinate with you. Maybe I could get your information so when they do come, they can talk with you and, and make sure that there's um, uh, your concerns are being met with regards to uh, how they approach the poll for installation. I would just add um, <clears throat> that the equipment, um, the radio equipment, is uh, over 11 feet <coughs> off the ground. It's about 12 and a half feet to the center. So that's most likely above the bush. And uh, like he said, um, downstream of normal traffic, uh, sort of at a five foot level, so they can read it, would be um, uh, the meter, the meter uh, for the, for the uh, secondary the power yeah. service. Um, but there'll be nothing on the ground. It, it's all mounted uh, and elevated. On the border, is this interactive or do I wait till we're done? No, you'll wait. Yes. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would add there, too, is that the, um, the pole is actually owned by the utility purveyor. Yeah. Um, Verizon Wireless actually gets a license on that pole. Mm -hmm. um, so the pole was changed out, but that's a re as a result of them determining that the pole needed to be changed. Um, right. So that's that's not necessarily something we request. Um, yeah. It's done through that licensing process. Yeah. And it takes a long time. It's mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but we might be able to post a, a notice uh, just uh, stressing the concerns that she had. I think there was a couple questions about maybe the power. Um, the power that was said before, that was, that's the wattage that the radio um, emits. Um, this particular site, um, which is typical for most cell sites, um, it would have a, a 100 amp uh, service, uh, single phase, um, very similar uh, to what you have, may have on a, a normal uh, apartment or single family residence. Um, it doesn't necessarily need 100 amps, but uh, and generally 100 amps uh, is the least amount of service that you can request from the utility purveyor. Uh, generally, each radio um, gets a, a, a breaker of about 20 amps. Uh, so that'd be like uh, similar to the amperage of, of uh, maybe an outlet string in your house. And then um, with regards to uh, the 911 calls too, um, although uh, it was um, pointed out that uh, the calls do get made in the school, we're concerned also about the areas outside the school, whether someone's playing soccer uh, and other people are in and around the area. So it's, um, it's good that they have that within the building and we're uh, considering the other aspects of the uh, potential of needing a 911 call. Um, Verizon is a big company, but uh, all of the people in this room are potential customers. Uh, they care very much about their installations. Uh, they comply with all federal, state, and local laws. Uh, they continue to do that and strive for that. Um, but they do want to make sure that they, uh, they're responsible and uh, a good neighbor uh, to the uh, the town in the city of uh, Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other comments? So quickly, <coughs> Sue Timberlake again. So quickly doing the math, I'm getting there's three radios pointed in 360 degrees, 20 amp circuits, 15 amps per radio, which three times 15 is 45 amps that you came up with. Am I doing that right? Does that sound right to you? So there's actually only a single radio? Oh, there's only, it doesn't go 360? Well, the antenna. The goes. antenna goes 360. Oh, okay, I thought you but said there are multiple. Um, three. No, just, just a single radio that goes into antenna and then broadcasts a signal in a direct 360 direction. And so there's 20 amps per, um, so there's, sorry, I can't read my own handwriting here. So I get 60 amps, but maybe I'm mistaken in that. And then a hundred amp for just service for the whole pole. Um, so <clears throat> I heard you say twenty one hundred megahertz, and you said, "Well, they do seven hundred and eight fifty, nineteen hundred, twenty one hundred in Western Mass." On this pole, <laughs> is it going to have three G capability, four G, five G, and six G? So it will have all the frequencies for the new. Is that a yes? No, this pole is only going to have 4G capabilities. So just 2100? That's correct. Okay, thank you. No. And um, I still want the optical fiber connection to my house. Oh. <laughs> oh, and the last thing, I forgot. So when you turn that box around, I'm gonna be sitting on my swing in my apple tree and looking right at it. So instead, I'd like to propose, because he's not here, John Martin, my neighbor, if you could just turn it. So that you would look at it. Sorry. Um, Thank you. I'll just speak to one of those points, which is the, it's the FIOS service. So uh, I will openly admit I am in Springfield and I want FIOS too. <laughs> but um, what, what I can't say is that the introduction of, of Verizon Fiber at this utility pole will in any way affect the company's decision to where they install FIOS next. But what I can say is that one of the nice things about having this technology um, in in a, a localized area um, and safely, you know, brought to homes is that it does allow homeowners more choices. For those homes um, that will benefit the most from this service, um, um, safely entering their homes, um, in many cases you can buy Verizon products um, that will take that uh, LTE signal and convert it to Wi-Fi. So a lot of people after. Um, noticing this new technology will cut the cable cord and, 
invest in um, you know that type of alternative uh, technology. So um, it's an option, and you know um, it's something every individual you know consumer has to decide for themselves. But um, that's another potential added benefit, both to the company and the neighborhood. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. We do have one more hearing on our agenda. So. I'm sorry, and <laughs> I apologize. Okay. And maybe they'll have some of the same issues, but not you know my neighborhood. Um, so, uh, shoot, I just forgot my train of thought. Um, I have completely forgotten it, so I, I apologize for that. It was an important question that I forgot, but I'll have to save it for another day. So, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will comment that if you remember it and we move oh, on it. to another. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, when I lived in Belmont, the Verizon person would walk around with us. I used to help the, um, the Board of Selectmen do the hearings. Mm -hmm. And so, if the landowners or the neighborhood said, please, can you come just show us? Do you guys do that, and is that an option from this hearing as part of this process? Um, what, what would they show you in particular? The box, which bush I'd let them cut down, you know, all that stuff. Because I, I assume the bush has to go, but it is an ornamental yeah. bush. Yeah. So yeah. I'd love to have somebody say, yeah, you know, we're going to cut this half, and it'll look like, you know, the half of a, you know, look like the um, uh, when the electric poles you know, you see the tree with a big hole in it. It's like, you know what, I'd really rather not. Yeah. Is there a way to do that with whoever the service is that will um, do yeah. the? So I understand um, that from the, the survey that the bush is actually in the right of way. So that, so it isn't on your property line, it's on it's, the. It's inside the original wooden fence. There you all are. The corner fence is still there. I put up a metal fence, but there's a wooden fence. Yeah. And where they moved the pole to is actually inside that. and. You know, those old property lines, that was one of the first houses down there in 52. Right. So, right. But I guess what I'm saying is that if they need to take the whole bush, right. I'd like to s say that to them. It's not out of the question, right. but I just want to see what the options are. I given think my understanding is that it, that, um, that that isn't necessarily only Verizon, that because it's in technically in the right of way, that DPW has purview over right. it. So I don't know what the right. The poll company you know. was great. They told me about the, the cell tower coming. So it wasn't yeah. actually part of the process that, yeah. so they, they warned me. I'm just saying yeah. that I'm used to having the company say, yeah, we'll, we'll have somebody walk around and we'll figure out how to cut right. this out so that yeah. it. And that's not something like that we would condition or yeah. not something we can ever mandate. Is this zoning or special permit or uh, what is this? This is the planning board and this is a site plan review. Site plan and then it goes to the um, city council? So there's a pro so there are a couple things. This is site yeah. plan review. The board can't say no to a permit unless it doesn't meet the technical standards. Mm -hmm. um, it's a majority vote. Um, this because it's a poll in the right of way, it may need other approvals. It's not a new poll. So city council is well. They put in a new poll that's taller and in a different spot. So let me finish. Okay, sorry. Um, the poll poll. Hearings are required by city council for new polls. This is new equipment on a poll. There may be some licensing that is required by the city for adding to a utility that's in the public right of way. I don't, I don't believe it goes to city council, um, but it would. Um, but there may be. So the the mayor's office would be able to tell Verizon whether it needs to. What what other licenses might be required from the city side? So this so might this part be is it. just about approving telecommunications right. systems on an existing poll. And because it's on an existing poll, it's site plan and not special permit. Um, you could, if there was a concern about um, removing the bush, you could require a permit condition that says you know, a replacement on the property if you felt, if the board felt like it was appropriate to replace any vegetation that was being removed, you could certainly put that as a condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess what I was really asking for was the condition that I get shown and I can easily say, just take it, you know, be done with it, it's totally fine, or can we save it? Which takes somebody looking at it and seeing how awful it's going to look in the spot, not replacing it somewhere else on the property. And that may not be within your purview. And the last question is who gets the pole attachment fee? Who, there's a fee involved, and there's a pole attachment fee. Do you know who gets that? Well, we, we have licenses with the pole owners, which is uh, National Grid. And National Grid? Thank you. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Yes, ma'am.
Karen Schiaffo again. Full disclosure, I'm a Verizon customer, and uh, I love my service as it is right now. Um, I just so I just want to clarify. So this this the objective of this project is to improve telecommunications, and so it, it's my understanding that this mini cell uh, has a short range from 500 to 1,000 feet. Correct? Yes. So I just want to reiterate that cell phones are not allowed. It's the policy of JFK. So the students, 620 students who may have a cell phone are not supposed to be using it. And it's the, our policy. So um, I, I, just, I just want to say that. And the other comment I want to say is uh, it was mentioned that the FCC, um, the FCC hasn't reviewed their standards since 1996 and cell phone use has increased substantially. And I feel very strongly that we need to look at the health hazards of an increased exposure. Um, right now, we're, there are 300 million cell phones in use in the United States. And so I, I appeal to you to please not support this project. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Spring Grove Ave, and the I did do some reading about you know the you know the 1996 and some research since then, and it seems that there's enough question in in my mind about potential health uh, risks that I wonder what other locations have been considered. It sounds like you know uh, one of the towers is on on the top of a mountain and another is on a smokestack, and I'm wondering if less populated um, locations for this have been considered or ruled out or how that. Um, is logical because to me it seems that if we have the option to not go in a densely populated area, why not do that? Thank you. So um, this question about safety, um, the board uh, cities actually don't have the ability to turn down telecommunications facilities if they, um, if it is shown that they're meeting, I mean, you have you have certain um, jurisdiction to um, determine whether you believe that it's filling a gap, but the standard is the cities have to accept these systems. At 1996 is the most recent data from the FCC. You, the city cannot turn down a project because someone provides evidence about um, or concerns about safety because it all falls on as long as they're meeting the FCC regulations right. there's nothing the board can do um, they've shown that they're filling in a gap in the system which is what's required in the zoning ordinance to show that they're doing that so there's a difference between the tall towers and these small cell towers as you've you know, as was explained in the application and the presentation, is it's meeting different um, demands, um, and these are filling in the gaps in you know in small geographic areas. And mm -hmm. you guys approved two others a couple months ago, mm -hmm. uh, or four others actually, um, essentially accomplishing the same thing: filling in gaps between you know bigger systems. So at this point. The way that the the board sort of does its its work is we have our public hearing, we hear from the public, um, and then at a certain point we close the public hearing so that the board can have discussion about what we've heard. Um, sometimes we keep the public hearing open if we feel like we want to ask some more technical questions from the applicant, um, but if we feel like we have all the technical information that we need to have a discussion about the merits of the project, um, then it's <coughs> customary for us to close that public hearing and then deliberate amongst ourselves in front of you um, so that you can hear everything that we're thinking about. Um, so I guess I would ask my fellow board members if we would like to keep it open because we may have questions of the applicant, we can do that. Um, but as, as long as it's a new stuff, right? A lot, uh, you know, as long as yeah. they come in, bring in new stuff, new information, information that has uh, not been brought up yet, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you keep on repeating, and then yeah. So right? we'll we'll keep the public hearing open for now, but have discussion among ourselves. We may ask for some clarification on a couple of things. Um, so as Carolyn said, you know, we we can't mm -hmm. deny, uh, you know, unless 
Um, the applicant has not shown that they are filling a gap. I, I do, I am sensitive to, to the broader concerns that were raised, um, you know, and, and it sounds like outside of the city of Northampton that there maybe should, the FCC maybe should prioritize a review of updating its standards. Um, you know, I don't know what, you know, how we can organize to help make that happen, but it isn't something that we can do this evening um, in the context of this particular site plan review. Um, you know, it, it, it is, a, I was surprised to see in the application that it is a fairly small unit, you know, that it's in scale with the, the pole itself. It, you know, it, I was worried before I opened it up that it would be a sort of behemoth thing, yeah. but it is, you know, 24 inches tall, 15 inches diameter. It does seem fairly small. Um, so uh, aside from that, you know, I, I don't have other specific concerns about the installation itself. To me, the main issue is location, where it is located. For I think that's what I'm hearing, right? Um, and I think that is a reason to be on that spot, right, guys? Right. So you cannot move away from JFK. You cannot move away <laughs> some a couple of feet feet uh, away from the bushes or that kind of stuff. Right. I'll just um, briefly say because I respect your point about um, not wanting to repeat ourselves that um, you know the from day one our, our purpose was to uh, locate on existing infrastructure in and around um, the middle school for the purposes of um, aiding service at the middle school, aiding ingress and egress uh, around the middle school. Um, and I'll just make another comment. Um, that uh, we see more and more, as Eric mentioned, the comment about um, you know people cutting their home lines, but in particular, uh, a growing percentage of the total wireless usage um, that is being used in the United States is indoors. So um, yes, in, in some cases, when we're trying to cover very large gaps in service, it's still appropriate to uh, build large facilities. And in some of those cases, they can be built um, in a lot of different locations, but what we're trying to do is provide dedicated service um, in a small geographical area uh, where we have identified a need. And so for um, that reason, yes, this facility um, needs to be in this area. Just one more thing I want to say. It, it seems that you guys are over there to serve and to expand existing businesses, right? To serve the community and <coughs> expand Verizon business, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to see how I can think about it because, as you said, right, you, you cannot say no. That's what I understand. But just to trying to understand this whole discussion, why the, the community is reacting to, why you guys are here, or why do you want on that location, um, I'm just... Um, and I think you already explained how much you serve the community, right? The sure. school, that's right. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, I, I think what I think what the you know why are we here? We're, we're here to get a petition uh, approved um, so that we can enhance our service. But in addition, you know, we're all here as professionals and experts to answer your questions and hopefully educate um, the community. So to the end that it's. Uh, beneficial to the public and the board to keep asking questions about need and, and how it works. We're happy to continue to do that so long as you think it's appropriate. That's more my purpose of asking the questions, just to see the you know the community is here, you guys are here, and you articulate these ideas and yep, right. Yeah. <clears throat> if the JF, uh, the if the school wasn't involved at all, if it didn't even exist, this would be supplying better service for Bear Hill, which is the condo community up mm -hmm. top, correct? And it would be serving the community to the south, I guess that would be. And it seems like there's a lot of residents around the school if the school didn't exist, since we've been told that they're not allowed to have cells, phones there anyway. So my question is, does this small cell tower, forgetting that JFK is, is what you're saying you're trying to help, will it help others around it? Absolutely, if I could refer you again to this um, coverage um, map that just has a single map on it. Um, if, if
if you look again, um, you know, uh, there's three different coverage levels. And again, green is your indoor service. Yellow is your in-car service. Uh, gray is your outdoor uh, service. And you'll see it covers uh, a pretty expansive um, number of streets. Um, it does get over to the um, you know, at least to the periphery of the condo complex in terms of providing outdoor service or in-car service. Um, it provides a number of streets or portions of streets with indoor service and, and it is um, a fairly dense residential area which is uh, along with commercial downtowns like the one Northampton has are typically our two um, greatest areas of demand and growth. Um, so yes, it has um, benefits to the whole neighborhood uh, which includes the middle school. Thank you. Sarah, any questions or comments? I think so. Seems pretty straightforward to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, just I mean, I, I'm dialogue, glad that, right? yes, I'm just glad that, purpose, I think. yeah, yeah and I think you're right. It's an opportunity to yeah. get the public talking to Verizon. And just to add to that, one of the things we should have added uh, at the very beginning, so when we select a poll, it's a combination of working with RF and with, with regards to a need, mm -hmm. but we also have limitations on uh, what National Grid and Verizon uh, allow us to use. So there's certain polls we can't use. We can't use polls that have transformers. We can't have, use polls that have too many <coughs> risers on it. Mm -hmm. We can't use polls that have uh, too much primary power and depending on what that voltage is. So we are, that does narrow down where we can go. And then that, in combination with where RF is looking to offload, is kind of where we start to uh, narrow down the locations. And then um, I just wanted to add, with regards to uh, existing laws and safety, um, Verizon is a SEC licensed facility. Should any law or SEC license requirements change, they have to change with it. So it's if it. If it changes in a certain direction, they will follow it to be compliant. Thank you. Any additional comments? No. I, I just tell I used to have a Verizon, and I changed for AT&T. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. <laughs> that does not. <laughs> but that's not the point. Just, just bring some humor here. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, if there aren't other comments or discussion from the board, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Um, motion. Are you, are you still going to discuss uh, three nights, uh, uh, the, other, the other one, right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. we will. Yep, that's a separate agenda item. Yep, okay. it's a separate site plan for us. Okay, okay. So let's move. Okay, uh, I move the, the motion, entertain the motion to close the public hearing. What? Yeah. And is there a second? All those in favor. <laughs> and is there another motion? Motion to approve the site plan for Verizon Wireless to add panels to the existing pole near 190 Spring Grove Ave, Florence, um, map ID 17A-17, um, with the condition that this they still need to get other city permits as required. Yeah. All those in favor? Those opposed? So that site plan is approved. So our second 7 p.m. hearing is also for Verizon for um, a plan to add existing uh, panels to a utility pole near 395 Elm Street, Northampton map ID 24C-37. second poll in question is a utility pole that's in front of 395 Elm Street. Uh, it's uh, across the street from the Northampton High School. Uh, the panel antenna at this location is also proposed to be on top of the utility pole. Uh, the same equipment will be installed on the body of the pole with uh, the supporting equipment with electrical uh, meter. Uh, no ground equipment is required or proposed. Uh, the pole is screened from the house that's located in front of us, similar to the other uh, application that was spoke to earlier. Um, the house uh, and Nearly identical. 
identical uh, proposal to the previous um, and similar uh, needs for this particular site. Um, <clears throat> again, very similar uh, equipment going on the pole. You know, it's a little bit different. Uh, this pole's got a uh, primary located on the top as well. Um, with that, we have a little bit different rules uh, from the utility company, uh, but the same equipment um, and, and basically the same connection of that equipment uh, applies in this location. Um, so the existing pole here is about uh, 28 feet tall, so that would make it a, a, a 35 foot class pole. Um, it's got secondary and primary power on it, along with some existing communication lines. Um, Verizon here is proposing to locate at the top of the pole. Um, and it's got a little bit of different antenna proposed here, uh, but same basic, basic uh, function. Uh, this one's a little bit more directed to a particular uh, location, but we'll have uh, RF talk a little bit about that. Um, and we have to relocate a couple of things on this particular pole through our licenses with National Grid, but uh, the same general things apply. We have an antenna located at the top that propagates the signal. Um, at the bottom, we have a meter and a disconnect uh, that would pull secondary power from existing sources. Um, we have a, uh, a communication line. If there's not fiber on the pole, it gets put there. Um, and then we have our RF equipment here that uh, um, generates that signal. Similar to the other site, um, the equipment is located, you know, downstream from traffic. This would be on the sort of the back side of the pole. Um, and uh, the only real difference to note here is that this antenna uh, proposed here is, is, is directional. It's got a particular azimuth that's pointing in a particular direction to, to get, uh, to solve a particular problem. So I would defer to our uh, to talk a little bit. Good evening again, Jay Latori, RF engineer of Verizon Wireless, home address 122 Forest Hills Road in Springfield. Um, my colleague Mary Ellen is passing out an engineering necessity case for you to review and was included in the application. Uh, this facility is called Northampton High School, uh, small cell mass. Uh, I prepared an engineering necessity case uh, and it also was updated uh, in September. Um, a lot of this information, as you might imagine, is very similar to the previous uh, site plan application we just discussed. Mm -hmm. So uh, out of respect for the board, I'll, I'll just kind of highlight some of the um, high-level differences. Um, I'm going to call your attention to a couple of uh, pieces of information in here. Um, much like with the first site plan application, you'll see a set of maps in this document. Um, the title being coverage at 2100 <coughs> megahertz. Um, and uh, there's a couple of different facilities in here, so I, I just want to call them out to you. Looking at the map on the left-hand side, you'll see in the middle uh, there's a little uh, dot that doesn't have a pie shape on it. That's Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Um, Verizon has an indoor wireless system in there. We only cover the inside of the hospital. I want to clarify that because other carriers have antennas on the top of the hospital there. Um, there are two facilities that have pie shapes around them that are um, shown color in and providing 2100 megahertz service. Again, the same 4G LTE service we talked about in the first application. Uh, to the northwest in this document, you'll see Florence, which is that smokestack um, in the middle of Florence. And then in the uh, what would be the southeast corner, there's another facility. Uh, that's a, a rooftop facility that Verizon is on on top of Thorns Marketplace, and that's where um, most of the service comes from. I do want to mention, and I, I do apologize, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, I made the same mistake on this map, um, that the coverage layers are the same. However, what you're not seeing is that behind that box is Verizon's uh, co-location on King Street. There's a very large tower. I think it's close to 200 feet, and Verizon is on that as well. And that's where that coverage in the northeast corner of this map is coming from. So I, I do apologize for that. 
Um, and then if you look towards the center of the map and um, very close to the center, you'll see the proposed application of a single pie shape. And uh, if you look at the second map, the map on the right side of this uh, page, you'll see proposed 2100 megahertz coverage. And you'll see uh, an area of green, yellow, and some gray um, colored in to reflect uh, what the proposed facility is modeled for coverage. Um, I'm going to refer you then to the next page, which also has the title, uh, bless you, uh, coverage of 2100 megahertz. Um, it's a zoomed in map, um, and this is an additional map that um, we were asked to provide for the board. Um, a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, the one difference is that the map was included in this. The other thing I wanted to mention was that there was a request from the board in particular for this site to kind of get a visual as to how this facility relates to and works with um, two of uh, four facilities that were approved by the board back <coughs> in March. Um, a proposed facility on Riverside Drive and then another proposed facility on Elm Street. And you can see both of those facilities um, on this map uh, with circles around them. Uh, they're not colored in. Um, and they're not broadcasting because they're not physically built yet. Um, Verizon is working through its regulatory um, approval process um, right now, actually. I'm doing some of that work to get those approvals. Um, but I, I um, wanted to make sure I showed them so that you kind of had a feel for um, how uh, my RF design envisions kind of um, the growth of wireless service in this area. So. Um, as Mr. Marino kind of alluded to, this facility is a little bit different in that the coverage is targeted. And instead of having omnidirectional coverage, it's focused at one point, namely uh, Northampton High School. Um, in particular, the high school um, is uh, another facility that in the last year I, we walked with uh, Mr. Pagan from the IT and school department um, and found there to be some notable issues with um, lack of service and lack of capacity. Um, the same principles apply, uh, the only difference being that uh, obviously with a high school uh, cell phone usage is clearly more accepted and this is a, a fairly you know, larger facility for four grades along with a larger you know, uh, professional staff. Um, so, so the antenna, which is similar in size, is, is more of a panel instead of a cylinder. Um, if you want to see a detail of that, if you look at the site plan and you look at um, page C4 on the, uh, thank you, Jesse, on the lower left-hand side, you'll see the antenna detail. So the antenna um, it is uh, 27, uh, point, 27 feet 4 inches in height, so just a little over 2 feet instead of 2 feet exactly, and it's 6.5 inches in uh, depth and so that antenna is um, like uh, Mr. Marino said is um, is sectorized it's pointed at a specific goal essentially the goal being to make sure we drive service into the high school um, as well as some of the surrounding areas behind it um, and that's really the, the key major difference here but the, the theme is the same uh, you know Verizon investing in right-of-way infrastructure to help grow our, our reliable service areas um, that has great impact to public safety and uh, innovation and education. And again, the same concept, you know, whether it's school buses or, or parents or professionals, uh, it, it assists with um, creating that capacity for ingress and egress. So those surrounding facilities, when there are congregation points, whether it's, you know, um, schools in session or right before school or right after school, this handles the local traffic so that the larger facilities can handle their larger footprints without getting overburdened. Um, everything else is essentially the same in terms of frequency, in terms of the technology um, we provide and the benefits. So um, what I'll certainly again be available for any questions you may have. Um, and uh, you know, uh, thank you again for taking the time to hear us. Just one quick clarification. Sure. So those other two sites that we had previously approved on Riverside Drive and on Elm Street, those are 
omnidirectional? Can you just remind? They're both omnidirectional. That's correct. So yeah. with the one on Riverside Drive, there would be a little bit of overlap in coverage. Yeah. Much overlap. Yep, that's coverage. absolutely correct. And and I'll kind of I'll um, extend my conversation on that. What I wanted to show on this um, map is a is a great point regarding um, wireless service. So so wireless service uh, in RF design is a is a tricky thing. You need to have some overlap because there's a period of time where your mobile device, whether it's your cell phone or your tablet or something in your car that has a signal, um, can communicate to both facilities and measure the power from both of them to decide which one it's going to hand off to. That's why you can drive from you know here to upstate Vermont and, uh, and hopefully not lose your signal because the towers talk to one another. But if you have too much overlap, um, that reduces your signal quality because you have too many locations that more or less have the same signal. So what ends up happening is that the device says, I want to be here. No, I want to be here. No, I want to be here. So you need to cover, create areas of overlap but minimize them. Uh, and that's what we're trying to show here, that uh, there is coverage close enough to the other facilities that there will be some overlap for ubiquitous service, we call it, but not so much that they're going to interfere dramatically. So, Thank you. You're welcome. This particular site has uh, the same benefits and the same uh, information, so I won't uh, repeat myself. But uh, one of the things I do want to add is that uh, when Verizon looks to meet a need in a specific area, uh, we're going to find that we're now going to be going more and more into residential areas because the industrial areas have their sites and other structures have their sites. But when you get into an interior uh, place like this, there's not too many options for us. We think that placing them on utility poles such as this is minimal for the benefit that we're providing. Otherwise, it's a much larger facility. The downside is it's a smaller footprint and we have a couple more of them, but we believe that the minimization of the installation compared to a full site uh, would be beneficial and more conducive for a residential area. Um, again, this pole was chosen because of the characteristics of the pole and um, the approval of the utility owner for us to co-locate on it. Um, <coughs> so that necessitated the need to be there. Uh, but we, um, which we believe that this, in conjunction with other types of installations, is, is the best that, uh, for this particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, it's just the question you made because I thought we just approved one not long ago, right? right? So <laughs> eventually have so many poles all over. So that's I was trying to understand <laughs> how does that work? Uh, because the one uh, was not too far, the one we approved, mm -hmm. right? On uh, at the corner across the uh, Kensington, Kensington and Elm Street. Mm -hmm. um, it seems so close um, that I, I just... Uh, yeah, I'll just generally say that um, just that eventually you have so many poles all over as we encroach into the residential that uh, to me is kind of a oof. I think they're all are existing poles. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, no, but in terms of, uh, you know, how. Right. No, I, I think I understand you have, your you know, question. Are, are we going to, you know, um, proliferate the entire city with these this uh, infrastructure? Yeah. So um, certainly I can't. Um, predict the future and yeah. I wish I had a crystal ball I would go play the lottery right away <laughs> but um, you know that being said in all seriousness um, you know we take a very targeted strategy what we do every day is analyze our existing structures and we do what essentially would be called a stress test for capacity we evaluate uh, where they're taking service um, where we're dropping calls uh, if we're providing service, are we doing it in a robust way so that the customers are getting what they pay for? Or are they getting, you know, a level of service that really is, is inadequate for what they pay for? Um, and when we find that there's inadequacies, whether it's our call service, um, you know, um, or, or call quality or capacity, you know, those are the areas we go after to, to offload. We think we do a really good job of it. Um, you know, each one of these facilities, um, I can tell you, and I apologize, we, we, I, um, I could have done one more map to kind of show all three of them turned on, but 
they, they all do something different, even though they're relatively co close to one another. The, the, this one here, the high school, um, is really designed to offload the high school and make sure that there's very robust service. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a three or four story school and we wanna make sure we cover all the floors. Um, the, the facility on, on Riverside Drive is more residential and in particular, it's in an area where we, we know our coverage is less than reliable and we're excited to build that facility to eliminate a gap. Um, versus the facility on Elm Street, which is uh, also very residential and heading a little bit closer to Smith College where you've got some uh, dense homes, you've got apartments with maybe you know uh, four to eight different students in them, you've got more on-street traffic both from vehicles and people walking to and from downtown. So um, they, they all have their particular locations. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll say generally that Verizon invests a lot of money in its existing facilities. Um, and, and that's kind of the easiest thing for us, right? Because we, you know, we don't have to bring new fiber. We don't have to bring new power. We, you know, we change the radios, we change the antennas. Um, and that works out great for us. It, it's, uh, it's, it's more work for us to come um, before boards and, and announce a commitment to bring power and fiber and antennas to a new facility. Even a small one like this takes coordination between uh, our team, the wireless team, Verizon Landline, National Grid. There may be um, uh, Mass Broadband Institute or Comcast or Charter, um, you know, or, or uh, um, a fire station, you know, emergency line on there, all of which may have to be adjusted to make room. So there's still a lot of coordination on a small site. So I, I think the fact that we have this many in this location reflects Verizon's commitment to wireless services in the city and for our customers. Um, and I think if I could just say generally, you know, where are we going to build these facilities? We're not going to build them everywhere, but we're certainly going to target them in areas where population is more dense. And, and growth is more likely to come, as well as areas that maybe aren't as dense, but either have um, a coverage issue that isn't so great to warrant um, a larger facility, but taking advantage of existing infrastructure, fairly innocuous compared to what's there now with an existing pole, um, we strike a nice balance. I hope that answers your, your question, yeah, um, you know, that as best as I, as I can. Yeah. Thanks. The point is that uh, always when you guys come, there is always a neighbor or a neighborhood who come along with. So that's what makes me wonder why, why there is this kind of rejection. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's yeah, I mean, public comment. Yeah. <laughs> so if there are, I think there are probably some folks um, here who would like to make public comment. So if so, please come to the podium. And again, state your name and your address, please. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jerome Brossard. I'm at 401 Elm Street, and that's uh, roughly the second closest house to this site. Mm -hmm. um, first, I wanted to point out a couple of po possible errors or issues. Um, the notification for the meetings tonight um, listed Verizon as being the applicant with instructions to go to your site and find the app, find the listing with that name, mm -hmm. but that is not that um, is not there. It's listed under National Grid. So the likelihood that there are interested parties who would have wanted to come is, you know, um, is clearly there. Thank you. You're, you're missing people who, but otherwise, might have been here. A um, couple of other um, issues. Um, the um, the plans, as I was reading them, um, the, the presentation seemed to indicate that it would be the existing poll that would be used. The plans pr pretty clearly show that the, a new poll that's slightly higher will be put in. So I think that should be addressed. Um, the other uh, issue with the plan, this, um, this drawing right here, which is kind of the detail of where the antenna is going to be located, actually shows the antenna being pointed at our neighbor's house, my neighbor's house, 399, not at the high school. So I'm, I'm sure that's an error, but an error that significant to me calls into question. And can the, you just uh, clarify which specific? Uh, so this is. It's the one with all the drawings. <laughs> does that say C4 at the bottom uh, left? Yes, it does. At the bottom right? So the center, the center one that has the, it's the plan view, the top down. Mm -hmm. So it's showing the street at the top, the grassy section below. And if you know anything about this site, the grassy section below is 
on the uh, the not the high school side, it's on the neighbor side, or the, the residential side, and the antenna shown here is clearly pointing away from the high school, not at the high school. So that's a fairly significant um, error in the drawing. So I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, I've been at Northampton, I, I've been in, at 401 Elm Street for almost 20 years. Um, I've had excellent um, Verizon coverage during that entire time, even down in my basement, until about three to six months ago, in which, in that, at which point the, there were obviously changes made in their network, which made the coverage much, much worse. I can only actually make a good phone call on the second floor on one side of the house now. So the need for this right at the moment is somewhat manufactured by the way they are managing their network. Um, um, I would like to suggest that this is, um, well, let me say that um, these drawings make everything look very flat. This area is actually fairly hilly. The Elm Street at that point is going down well downhill if you're kind of going northwest, I guess. Um, and the houses right near that are actually quite a bit uphill from this location. So there was a mention of the pole being screened from the houses, and maybe the very base of the pole is, but um, the middle section and the top of the um, pole are clearly um, visible. In fact, when I'm on our second floor, I pretty much look right out the top of the pole. So this equipment will be directly an eye line. It's not at all screened. Um, I would ask that since this is a facility that clearly is primarily benefiting the high school, that perhaps a high school location would be more appropriate. And there's certainly a fairly available pole that's not too off, far off from the entrance of the high school. That's about 100 feet back from the building or so, which I think uh, would be a worthy consideration. This particular location, that that um, where the antenna will be will be roughly 40 feet from my neighbor's house, and he'll probably speak in a moment, and about 60 to 70 feet from my house. So quite close. Um, I would like to um, clarify in this case also the actual power output um, uh, at the um, at the antenna, um, and when that's addressed, I would I'd want to make sure that if 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 you're um, noting power output, is that power output per channel or radio, and how many channels and radios are involved, because that'll impact to, uh, certainly the total of power output. Um, Let's see. Wanted to make note, um, just regarding the health effects, which is why I think probably most of the population is uh, gets concerned about these sorts of things. <coughs> um, Verizon's own links that they send you to on in their proposal, the World Health Organization, uh, 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 American Cancer Society, and the FCC. Um, in the American Cancer Society um, uh, uh, link that you go to, they um, make note that there are there is an international cancer organization that does list RF as a possible carcinogen. Um, additionally, I think it was probably in the FCC documents that they note that for roof-mounted, well, in all the documents, they all really deal with macro cells, which are the really big towers, like on King Street. No one's actually really talking about the small cells yet because they're actually fairly new. But um, when, it, with regards to macro cells, one of the things they talk about is that there are roof-mounted ones and that they acknowledge that care should be taken when being on a roof and doing maintenance near those facilities. And with this antenna 40 feet away from a house on, at eye level, that's actually kind of in line with a roof-mounted design. So it um, seems that additional caution would be warranted there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Hi. Hi, uh, my name 
name is Jeff Golany. I live at 399 Elm Street, um, which is the, I think, the basically the closest house. Um, I don't really have much to add other than I just wanted to say that I agree with Jerome's concerns um, and also noticed the fairly sudden degradation in Verizon service at my house as well, um, which would, uh, I would definitely love to get some clarification on if that was something that they saw and um, if this is something that would address that. It looked like our houses were in the coverage map. Um, and uh, yeah, and also wanted just to reiterate that the screen, like the comment about the pool being screened is is confusing, I think, because I can see it out my office window. I look at it several times a day. Um, but yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, could we have the applicant just do a couple quick clarifications about that power output and some of the other items? So um, with reference to the uh, comment regarding the antenna location, uh, they are correct. It's supposed to be aimed towards the uh, high school, not towards the opposite direction. Uh, we'll be happy to make that uh, amended uh, CDs and present that to the board. I apologize for that uh, misunderstanding and the uh, error that was on the plan. Thank you. Uh, with regards to the screening, yes, uh, the screening is on the bottom and it, not at the top. It's a large pole um, and it, it, it will have uh, the uh, top portion of it exposed, unfortunately, um, but everything will be um, directed towards the high school. Um, I, with the Concerns with the health issues, again, we're going to abide and uh, follow all of the guidelines and the current laws that we are required to follow per the SEC. Should those change, we'll also change and uh, make those um, adjustments. And with regards to the coverage loss and the RF information, uh, Jay will uh, address those. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of clarifications as requested by the public. So um, I'm just going to show this diagram here. Perfect. Okay, so, so first there was, I'm going to speak into the mic. Um, oh, I might not be able to go forever, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, there, there was a question regarding um, the radio power and the number of channels. Uh, this is the same radio that's proposed at the previous facility. So it's a 2100 megahertz output frequency. Uh, it's a 45 um, watt radio. Uh, there are four channels um, uh, that are utilized, um, each at 45 watts. Um, I think the next question was, what is the, the power um, at the antenna? Um, so the radio is, is co-located um, here at about the, uh, the bottom of it is at 12.5 feet. Um, the top of the, or I'll give you the midpoint of the antenna, which we call the center line. And again, I apologize, I'm, I'm on C3. Yep. Um, it's at 37.5 feet. So there's, um, it would be, we can call it, let's just say in a perfect world, the line to go right up, it would be uh, 25 feet of cable. Um, we use a coaxial cable. Um, it's half inch in diameter. Um, so um, coaxial cable has line loss to it. Uh, it's not significant line loss because it's not a particularly long piece of cable, but I would estimate um, based on my experience with these types of facilities with about a one decibel um, amount of uh, power loss. Um, I didn't do the formal math calculation, but I, I would estimate it at maybe you know 15 to 20 percent loss of power. So that at the radio, the power um, that's transmitted out is is closer to say 36 to 40 watts um, with that line loss. Um, there is gain in that antenna, um, much like. Um, when you're running cable down the street, at some point you reach a point where the line gets weak and you have an amplifier. Uh, that's what the antenna serves as. Uh, so there is gain into that antenna. 
Um, again, this is a directional antenna, so the majority of that gain is pushed towards um, the intended service area. Uh, and in this case, since, since it's directional as opposed to omnidirectional, uh, the majority of the coverage is pushed towards the high school. Um, there's, there's no antenna that can be physically designed to have no signal behind it. Um, but again, if I refer you back to the coverage plot, you, you'll see that instead of this, um, this uh, larger one uh, that's zoomed in, you'll see as opposed to the previous presentation where you kind of have a circular mm -hmm. um, map, you'll see for the most part that the coverage is pushed in the direction of the uh, antenna pointing south. Um, and there is some movement of the signal towards the southwest. And, and a lot of factors come into play. Uh, these, these modeling tools take into account the topography of the land, the height of the antenna, its orientation, power, existing infrastructure that might change the, um, you know, uh, the signal strength once it's hit. Um, but that, I believe, um, covers that question. Um, there was a question about degradation in service. I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. So, um, you know, Verizon hasn't done anything to purposely degrade its service. Um, if anything, we continue to invest in all of our facilities um, um, that are existing, and we're here tonight to again propose more facilities to further invest in the community. Uh, one thing that is known and is common in our part of the country is that our service is a lot better in the winter than it is in, in the spring, summer, and fall. And, and that's just physics. The wavelengths that we use for these frequencies turn out to be about a couple of inches which is not too different than the size of a leaf. So as the leaves come back, wireless signals do fade some, and, and some service that you might enjoy uh, between, say, November and early April um, will be weakened between mid-April to you know, late October. Um, that's not uncommon. Um, just like any other company, we have a 1-800 a, a number that our customers can call if you have uh, questions about your service if it's degraded uh, those questions get answered by our customer service team and in, in every case they eventually make their way back to people like me that analyze the area and we take a look to see if um, this is a result of maybe an issue on an existing facility um, or a known issue um, and the only other thing I'll add is um, you know, sometimes degradation in service doesn't come from sh signal strength, but actually signal capacity. We've seen explosive growth in our 4G service um, since it was launched in 2010. Eric cited some of those um, stats for you. And sometimes we find our signal um, is the same strength, but there's just more people on it. There's, or there's just more people using it more often. We've read studies that show that the amount of usage on a device is directly correlated to the, the quality of the picture. So you see everyone with these jumbo iPhones, they probably use and watch more video than the folks with the little ones. It, it's a view, viewer experience thing. Um, and so these facilities are not only meant to um, allow us to enhance capacity, they're also meant for us to keep up with capacity. Because as we invest further in our facilities, as we add capacity, we find our customers just use them more and more. Um, and so we're here tonight to further invest in um, that service because our customers have an expectation when they pay for service. They want it to be reliable um, so that they um, can enjoy their service and that they can feel that it's uh, safe. Um, and they want it to be enjoyable. They want it to, to work for what they might want to do. And lastly, again, I'll just mention without um, regurgitating that this site will be um, uh, will follow all FCC requirements and regulations for RF safety. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, as Eric mentioned, um, you know, if should our FCC regulations in this country change, Verizon will be required, and we'll be happy to change with them. Sure. Sure. And, and I'll just, um, Eric brought up another good point, you know, um, degradation in, in service. You know, one of the possibilities um, uh, and something we experience is that, you know, when schools come back in session, our facilities that might work great during the summer really start to struggle. I, I'm, I cover all of Western Massachusetts, so I look at high schools 
the, the, the 20 or so universities that we have out here. And we, we see that at well. And so again, um, installations um, that are safely designed in and around schools, I think have a, a, a good positive impact on everyone. And again, this takes advantage of the existing infrastructure as opposed to, to a much larger project that, that might uh, impede uh, non-existing infrastructure. Thanks. Can I just ask one more sure. really quick question about the actual device itself that goes on the top of the pole? You know, this one is a, a little bit bigger than the prior uh, yep. application. Is there any, do you have any experience um, during like extreme weather events? Do we need to be concerned about the kind of stability or any, you know, um, if we're kind of adding height to the top of the pole and we're being mindful of Sh sure. future so, extreme weather and, you know, and, yep. wind and such. So I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, first co blanket comment. Um, I, I have worked on and uh, helped install uh, through design over uh, 120 of these in Western Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. I've never had a problem with any of them um, falling over or antennas falling off. Um, the, the companies that Verizon uses for construction um, have all of their appropriate certifications, not only for construction, but also um, uh, electrical code. Um, National Grid um, it runs a structural on these before providing Verizon with a license. And, and that's important to note because Ver Verizon is requesting a license from National Grid. National Grid's primary service and I don't mean primary like power, like their main job is to provide service to communities and homes and, and businesses. So it's in their best interest to make sure that we're providing an installation that's not going in any way impact the hundreds of other customers that might get electricity and through some way or form through this poll. Um, the only time in my professional career that I've ever seen an issue um, with antennas was in 2011 when the tornado hit Springfield. Mm -hmm. And even in that case with very large facilities and, and our antennas on the towers um, have much more wind, um, you know, load exposure. You know, they're sometimes six to eight feet tall. They can be a foot wide. And the only thing we saw in those locations was that in some cases the antennas turned mm -hmm. and something that was supposed to be pointed at Springfield is now pointed at West Springfield. Mm -hmm. And we have to just go back up there and tighten it and put it back in place. And that's, that's my only professional experience on that. So um, these are all designed um, to the latest state building codes. Um, we work with Proterra extensively on a number of projects and very con confident in their quality of service. They're right here out of Hadley. And we certainly appreciate to have a, a, a local A&E firm looking at these, their neighbors too. Um, so uh, that's uh, my experience on that. Okay, thanks. I was going to say there was some concern about the height, but if I'm understanding this correctly, it looks like the, a new pole is being installed and the, the sight line is actually going to be, the antenna will be high enough that they're actually, I think, going to see a pole where they're currently seeing a pole, not to the antenna because the antenna is going to be above. Right, because the pole will be a, right. a little bit bigger, right. a little bit taller than right. the existing. So it doesn't seem like there's going to be, I mean, I don't know exactly what the sight line is, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be a huge detrimental effect. Um, I was just going to clarify that. <clears throat> that was a good point. I did say that it was the existing poll. Um, and what I was reading was the initial assessment on this poll when we walked it. Yeah. What came back during the licensing was that um, they were going to they're going to replace this poll. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is true. Um, <clears throat> the existing poll here is going to be replaced. Um, and the reason is, is so that this primary power that was once at the top of that pole has to be relocated down um, in order to put the antenna on top. So that was a mistake on my behalf. But originally when it was walked, the, um, the plan was to put it on top of the original pole. But like I said, the process takes, I mean, I think we walked this pole originally in, you know, almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, during the course of that period, um, through the licensing, there's a lot of different things they look at. Could have been a structural reason, could be, um, <clears throat> one of the things that often happens is one of the requirements to put a pole top on here is the age of the pole. Mm -hmm. And um, on a lot of the older poles, it's not stamped. On the newer poles, it is stamped. So if the if National Grid determines that the pole is over 20 years old, they will automatically replace it uh, if you're putting on um, equipment on the top. So 
I, I'm not positive, but I surmise that happened in this case. Um, I will say one other thing about the, uh, the sketch here. Um, that was in a very astute comment. Um, he is correct. What I will say, though, is that the RF design here uh, calls for an azimuth of 170 degrees. And all that means is if north is zero and the antenna, uh, if you started from the right and you went around, that 170 degrees, the direction of the antenna is correct. Um, it would have been built correct, but he is, the comment is correct in that the uh, direction of travel in Elm Street is on the wrong side. Um, and, uh, and looking back at this, I know exactly how this happened um, because typically in drafting, we want north to be up. In this particular location, the direction of the antenna was south, and it was our attempt to sort of do that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it, and that's my fault. I missed that. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that we do check often against the design is the direction of the antenna, and the direction of the antenna is depicted correctly. So I have all the confidence in the world that would have been built properly. But with that being said, it's a minor technicality. I can certainly update that for the file. I'd be happy to do that Thank um, you. because it should be correct. Thank you. And I'll just comment that this um, then new poll, because it's a new poll that would go through, as far as I know, will go through city council. Mm -hmm. the, a replacement poll? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think oh, okay. we have to, if it's going to be a replacement poll, I think it has to go through city council. Too. Okay. Okay. But that's on top of any other licensing that might be required for this equipment on an existing national right. grid poll. Got it. Got it. Any other discussion? Can I make one more? Make sure. One more? Yes. So you made the uh, point about the visibility of the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, I have a photo out my bathroom window. Sure. So <laughs> I'm happy to. So this is out my bath. Here's the pole. Uh -huh. There's the top of the pole. Okay. It's, it's going to be clearly visible. Okay. So you see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So there's the pole, top of the pole. So the, the additional equipment is going to be clearly visible and well on the sight line. You see a lot of wires already. Ah, uh, yes, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's not the greatest view already. <laughs> Too bad we can't put everything underground. Because yeah. <laughs> that's not a pretty sight now. <laughs> so, uh, any, would we like to make a motion to, do we feel like we can have some board discussion and move forward? Would anybody like to close the public comment? I was just going to pass around if there was any. It's kind of hard to tell in the drawings are far away, but this is an actual installation of what the thing kind of looks like. And I think what you said is exactly right. The scale of it, it seems large in the drawings, but if you'll actually see it, kind of blends in pretty nicely. This the scale of, mm -hmm. of the antennas here as a you know mm -hmm. as a function of the of the pole, you can kind of see the equipment there on oh, some I sides. See. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's the radio there, the antenna at the top. And say, what's the difference in these two? F this is the same exact site, it's just from a different vantage. Oh, okay, so, great. You know, one is looking at the side, yeah. right? One is looking at the back where you, you don't see that. Right. Um, you know, I can certainly sympathize with you, Butter, but just, yeah. I think I wanted to make the point of what you said before that, um, you know, as far as the alternative of a macro site, I think that you can get the idea of the scale. Even when I zoom in, mm -hmm. the scale of that equipment is relative to the pole is, is, is pretty small. Thank you. I'd like to move on. Initiate a motion to approve the project. And first, we would close the public Yeah, we we'll close it. Okay. okay. This is a motion to close. Yeah. Yes. Is there a second <laughs> for that? Jenna, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Uh, so now we have discussion among the board, and then oh, someone okay. may make a. If we need to have additional discussion. If not, if folks feel like we've heard what we need to hear and we feel comfortable that they have met their requirements in their application, we can go ahead and make a motion. Okay. I have no questions. I have no questions. I think I'm always sympathetic when abutters are here and things are changing, um, but, you know, there clearly is a demonstrated need. I think this is a fairly, uh, it's a fairly, it's, it's certainly gentler than a, a large high voltage power line or a large uh, freestanding cell tower. You know, I mean, it seems certainly better integrated than some other some other facility options that may be out there. Um, and I think, you know, again, as Carolyn said, this would require additional licensing and potentially go in front of city council as well. So there will be other folks who are looking at this and hearing the same 
um, the same pieces of information and making uh, their informed, you know, informed decisions. So. Mm -hmm. Any motion? Two. 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 <laughs> then you read that. I don't have the. Yes, you don't need that. <laughs> okay, I don't couldn't find my. Okay, to approve the. Yes, this one. This one here. To approve the site plan Verizon Wireless to add panels to existing utility pole near 395 Elm Street, Northampton, map ID 24C-37. Approve and approved with conditions. Any condition? Uh, that all of Other their than licenses this? and uh, all of their licenses and permits are granted. And then do you want to add, have an updated C4 sheet yes. with a yes. proper yes. direction? Yep. Okay. And that sheet C4 is updated and provided with the file. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Janet? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we just have two analogs. <gasps> okay. And our board has some additional business, so if you don't mind stopping to the we appreciate it. Um, so this first a &R is um, at the State Hospital um, the, on the north side of Ford Crossing. So the co-housing site that you all approved a couple of months ago is uh, in the northeast corner here, um, the TCB multifamily housing project is just north of here and then south is um, already built out residential you have um, these are five lots to be carved off of Ford Crossing you haven't approved a site plan for that yet so this is just for the creation of the lots but they can't build on those lots right till you approve the plan what's the funny little notch on that um, I think it has to do with a connection to this, um, or uh, this is the uh, park lot here. So there may be, um, I can't remember if there was a path through here that mm -hmm. was on um, TCB's lot. Mm -hmm. Got it. Would someone like to make a motion? <laughs> What's the motion in this case? This is uh, <laughs> um, have a have a plan endorsed, endorsed um, as an A&R. So moved? Yeah, but, but, moved. Yeah, so moved, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to second, Krista? I'll second that. <laughs> Those in favor? Yeah. Okay. Opposed? No. Uh, okay, and then the second one is actually there are two, this, this is two A&Rs, but it's just on one plan sheet because it's in the, generally the same area. Um, these are lots that were approved. Um, several years ago out on West Hampton Road and as um, the one on this side is just swapping some land between these two flag lots the property owner um, um, was enthusiastic about their landscaping and so did a little bit of landscaping technically over on the other property so what they're going to do is just carve that piece off and and give it to the person Remember that. That's that's very kind, right? Is that like very kind? <laughs> yeah, I mean it just helps with the development of that lot as well. I see. Um, you can just do that. You can just carve that out like that. Well, as long as you're meeting the requirements for zoning, so it's not <coughs> meeting any violation of the lot layout or anything. So yes, you can do land swaps as long as you're not um, creating any kind of um, additional problem as it relates to the zoning. Um, this situation on the other side, there's another property owner here. Um, there's a common driveway that serves these three lots. And um, the applicant uh, came back at one point, the owner uh, previously um, added this portion of the common, the shared driveway to this lot. But um, in doing so minimize the buildable area for this parcel so now they want to um, give this sliver back so that they can potentially create the building lot over there so again no frontage it's just a little land swap but it has to go through this process um, and so you would be voting on um, an endorsement that this is not a subdivision plan that it's just you know a minor Mm -hmm. 
a second? Diana, second. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Uh, no. And we don't have any minutes, is that right? Um, mm -mm. Uh, so there is one more very important motion. Happy birthday, yeah. No. <laughs> oh. But we have no other business. Oh. oh. So motion to close the hearing? Motion to adjourn, yes. Motion to adjourn, that's <laughs> good. Yes. Awesome. And, and Krista seconds, all those in favor of unanimous approval. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what?